Hello, and welcome back to Time. It's flying past us, and you can't do nothing about it. Well, in the last episode, we took some recon photos, and in this episode, we're going to just continue with the recon sense. We got all sorts of missions here to help us figure out how to deal with... Oh, there is a monkey down there. was not expecting him to appear, and yet there he is. Away with you, monkey. I have none of the business for you today. So, I want to talk about the certain thing which has happened. I am recording my commentary after just coming from a live show. Now, by what I mean there is that I went to a concert, but not necessarily like one of those professional concerts. I'm not talking like the kind of... You know, you, you pay for Ticketmaster and you go to the giant venue and all that stuff. I'm talking about spending a Wednesday night out on the town, going to a dive bar and seeing three different musicians, different bands play in the night. And I have to talk about this because it's something that I thought about while I was there, sipping on my Coca-Cola. Because I didn't drink anything because I had to drive back here to do this commentary. And as I was there, watching these groups perform and watching, you know, everyone sort of feeding off of the energy of the, of the building, of the music, and also of the audience. It struck me that I live in a place that is not known for artistic greatness. And in a sense, I do mean uh, the town I live in. But I mean just even the state in general. Like, I live in West Virginia in the United States. And West Virginia is not a state in America which is considered uh, one of great significance. Its reputation lies primarily on its back history of being a coal mining mecca, and also of being right on the borderline, literally on the borderline, between the north and the south. So there is a contingent of northernness to the state, but there's also a very, you know, like prominent contingent of, you know, that sort of southern America, and in both the good and bad elements of what that entails. But, uh... Where I live in uh, West Virginia, artistic expression, artistic ability is not something which was widely considered to be anything of great importance. There's no real cultural heritage. I really don't remember the layout of this level, and I have to get up there to those spice plants, and I have no clue where I'm going. Um, this is really kind of frustrating, I will not lie. I, oh man, god, that rhino respawned already, and he has family jewels on him again? Wow, is that an exploit that I could use throughout this game? I highly doubt I'm going to keep using it, but like, also, if, if it's there, I mean, I might as well. Bang. Zoom gangbusters. But, the point I'm trying to make here is that, you know... Where I live, and also to a degree where Nick lives, and where Rob lives, and where John lives, and all the people who I've worked with, and all the people who've been on this channel in the past, we're not. No, there is a cultural heritage there, but it's not one of high art. And it's not one of creative expression. Um, growing up here, being a college town with a relatively popular uh, football team amongst its ranks. Um, college football, of course. Nothing in the NFL. It's all the NCAA. But um, growing up here, it, we pretty much were predetermined that either you were, you like either. Well, it was just it was narrow. It was very narrow the window of opportunity living here, you know, and still is to be quite frank with you. I mean, there is a. There is a ceiling of opportunity that exists, and it's not addressed 
because it would be very deflating and depressing if it was addressed, but there is a limitation to the amount of creativity that is really permitted and allowed and accepted here in this town. And uh, that sort of has always been kind of a rogue element to that which we do. I think, you know, people talk about uh, coming out of hard times and doing something great with it, you know? You, you've you heard of, like, this sort of people who come out of the, the most unlikely places who do something extraordinary. And uh, I don't think that that's necessarily surprising because if there's anything that drives the creative spirit better than anything else it's the feeling of wanting to rebel against the confinement of your own environment and i think that is definitely prevalent with practically everyone who's been on this channel i don't want to you know group everyone in together because i'm certain that there are people who disagree with whatever i say um but it was something that struck me as I was sitting there in this bar where there were all these groups who were doing brilliant music, were doing great, great stuff, and had a small audience of about 100 people like there watching, listening, and partaking in the entire event and being part of something really special and, you know, unique. And I thought about this, and I realized that if I had not gone to college, if I had not gotten to college, and if I had not gotten my involvement in college radio, and if I had not been a part of a unique clique of people who all happened to share the same interests I did, and who were more extroverted than I was, so they went out a lot more than I did, I would have never known about it. And what was funny is that the people who helped me discover this sort of world, this sort of underground art movement, which was very prevalent and very healthy and thriving within the town, the small town I live in. Um, the people who knew about it was everyone on the outside. The people who were coming in from more, like, artistically thriving and encouraging sub communities elsewhere in the state and it made me realize that like anywhere can be an artistic mecca i think we have this false belief that the artistic centers of america are primarily new york and la and to lesser degree is probably chicago and uh seattle and maybe other places as well, like New Orleans or uh, Austin, Texas, or you know Nashville or Memphis or whatever. But we have this misconception that to be part of an artistic scene, you have to be in the most well-developed mecca sort of cities, the the ones that are the most prevalent and are, you know, like the most populated areas. And I don't think that's the case. I think the reality of it is that that monkey couldn't even care less that the elephant is running off into the distance. But seriously, though, it's like one of those things where we believe that you have to be in a certain place to really be a part of a culture or part of a community. And in truth, the reality is that you make your own community. And it's not totally geographically based. It's not completely dependent on the expectations or needs of big uh, culture centers or whatever. It's about the aesthetic and about the people and about where you are and who you surround yourself with. And that was something that really struck me. That it took until like my early 20s for me really to feel like I was surrounded by fellow artists and people who had the s most similar interests to me. And because I wasn't surrounded by that for the longest time and because also for the longest time 
the culture that was around me was very driven by, you know, sports or, you know, sort of like the salt of the earth southern flavor of, you know, that sort of thing. There wasn't a lot of room or encouragement for uh, the arts and things like that when I grew up, or where I grew up, rather. And um, that had an effect, I think, on my own development and my own sense of self and my own confidence and belief in my sort of abilities as a creative. You know, all these things play into each other. And yet... Here is, in a tiny, tiny club, late on a Wednesday night, a sub-community of artists doing their thing and celebrating and lavishing in the joy of creating that which is unique to them and expresses their own sense of self and their own sense of worth. And they're delivering it onto an audience who are not rejecting it but encouraging it. That can happen anywhere. It can happen in a major city or it can happen in a small, you know, little town in the middle of nowhere. And I think that, to tie it all into this video and why we're here in the first place, I think at its root core level, that is really what I'm in this business for what I'm in this enterprise for, why I'm not giving up on this channel, you know, yet after all the stuff that's gone on in the past. I think th the main thing I've always been ambitious toward and what I've always kind of wanted to see happen on a larger scale is to have a very artistically driven community and sense of togetherness and I don't know if that's really happened yet I don't know if uh, we've really seen that come to its fruition either on YouTube or on uh, or in just a grander scheme of things anyway because I mean especially I think we've seen maybe the potential for it to happen on YouTube but because now we're in sort of an era where, like, people, we, we see people complain about YouTube all the time, and it's, you know, backwards policies, and it's, you know, very unhelpful approach toward working with the creators that give it its grandest revenue. And all of these are major problems which need to be addressed. But I think what is fascinating about YouTube and what is encouraging about YouTube and everything else is that at its core level, what YouTube can represent and what it can be as a platform is actually something to be commended, in, in my opinion. It's something that is worth really like appreciating and being developed and being treated as something which is, you know, can be grown upon. We could have, truthfully, you know, the most DIY, artist-driven media landscape in the history of time. And yet, what we see is that as YouTube seeks to find acceptance from big business and find its place in that mainstream culture, which it exists as an alternative toward as it seeks legitimacy with these major corporations it, it runs against the sort of ethos and spirit that makes it work at its greatest moments you know, and I know I'm not the first person to say that, but it's definitely something that I was thinking about. Because, you know, whenever I go to shows, and whenever I'm in scenarios where I find myself surrounded by other talented people in their own given fields, you know, the, the base level thing I always am thinking about and I always want to do 
is to collaborate with these people. At its base level, I'm, I find I'm always thinking about what could happen if I took this person and, you know, brought them together with this person and just see where their talent takes them and what it delivers upon. And that would be what I would want for this channel, at least, is the sort of spirit of collaboration between a bunch of creative, artistically driven minds. Because any place can be an artistic community. Any venue, any platform, anything. As long as you cultivate it and encourage and support each other in your own endeavors and in your own pursuit of that which could really enliven the culture and also provide creators with a sense of accomplishment that they found their audience, that they found their creative outlook and their way of really contributing to the grander whole of the cultural po history of the world. I think in my very late night sleepy frayed ramble a point was made somewhere what time is it right now so it's 105 a.m <laughs> and my my voice is gone i was streaming earlier well i guess yesterday now and um i did that that was this is being filmed essentially the evening after the zelda stream where i took on varuda and I've been essentially shouting and screaming all day today for different reasons. Not necessarily angry ones. I, I, uh, today's actually been a relatively fun, exciting, jam-packed day, all things considered. So I'm sort of winding down by recording this commentary, and then but I'm going to go to bed, and by the time I wake up tomorrow, I'm going to have a whole bunch of stuff to edit down. Um, but I just wanted to knock it out because I figured, hey, I, I've been to this thing and I was thinking about lots of stuff. I might as well capture lightning in a bottle and just get my immediate post-show thoughts on uh, everything that happened in my evening. And I don't believe I will probably do this again as I currently am recording in my basement and it's an unfurnished basement it's uh i'll even do this so this is my recording setup right here you can see my laptop with the game footage and my microphone which is picking up my voice at the moment and you can see this very untidy unkempt unfurnished and unfinished basement which has got a bunch of stuff hanging from the ceiling. It's got these little metal plates uh, keeping the wall in check. We see workout equipment here from the people who do their workouts in this area. We see a wide collection of swords and axes and different sharp objects. Those aren't really mine. Um, but yeah, this is sort of the uh, recording environment I have right now. I had to go, whoop, there's my finger. I had to go and shut off this uh, furnace here, or the air conditioning unit, because at one moment while I was recording and talking, it turned on and started making noise while I was speaking. And in a non-soundproofed room such as this, you don't really want that because it kind of messes with the audio and causes a lot of nasty noise to be heard underneath the commentary. So, I don't think I'll record in here again. I like the green room. It's nice. It's relatively tidy. It, I can sit on a nice futon. It's got great natural acoustics. Totally on accident, by the way, too. Because... That room was not designed to be a recording studio, and yet it does the job incredibly well for what it's being used for. But at the moment, I'm in a basement.
and we'll see how the acoustics sound later when I put my compressing stuff on all my audio. And uh, oh boy, they are overlapping each other. I want them to go away. Just, yeah, just go chase that. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's just move away from all that. There we go. So then after I'm done recording here, I'm going to have to turn the AC back on. But at the moment, I had to switch it off because I could not record commentary with it on. It was very distracting. Also, I'm playing a game. <laughs> I have neglected to talk about this game at all. As it is late at night, and I have been uh, focusing all my efforts on, you know, doing this speaking stretching. But, um, yeah, we've been at this now for a while. This episode is relatively a longer one. You're going to see throughout this playthrough, the, le the episodes start to get relatively longer and longer. And not just because the uh, levels become trickier and trickier, which admittedly they do. Like, the game does get progressively more difficult as you go on, as, you know... It should. That's the mark of good game design. But also because the levels get more and more, like, spread out and expansive. And, in all honesty, get also kind of less memorable because of it, too. Expected, Rajan is out for his daily tour of the operation. My sources claim he always carries three blueprints on him, which, when read together, tell you everything about his spice operation. Well, what happens if he gets mugged on the street? Then does his spice operation plans just get immediately... Unfortunately, my sleep darts aren't powerful enough to affect Rajan. What? How are you gonna get at those blueprints? Rajan has an insatiable appetite for Indian watermelons, which, if eaten whole, will force even him to nod off for a while. Well then, why don't you just send him a package of watermelons and wait for him to narcolepsy himself out on watermelons? And then you can break in and steal everything there. Instead of doing all this nonsense. Just trank him with watermelons. Shoot watermelons into his gullet if he cannot, you know, handle not eating him. So... Now comes an interesting thing where, because of the darts, I have to start shooting him off to lead Rajan to where I need him to go. Now, of course, oh crud. And this is going to also attract guards and enemies, which I do not want because they will undoubtedly wake Rajan and cause this to be very, very difficult. Oh well, he's passed out, so now let's quickly try to nab this off of his person. No, that's a bomb. Ah, uh, I killed him. I mean, that also could get the job done. <laughs> if we could just, like, kill him and then break into his compound that way and steal what we need to do. I mean, we're gonna end up having to knock him out at some point anyway. Oh, you didn't hear those darts? Alright, how about these ones? There we go. That's more like it. Move over to the watermelon. You like the watermelon. Alright, there we go. Chow on down on them watermelons, Rajan. I know you can do... Oh, God, Goat Boy is there. I don't want Goat Boy there. If he wakes up Rajan, it will knock out the whole operation. Oh, well. Let's just do this. It Alright, so we got the first one. Ron's going to immediately wake up, so let's get under a table. Alright, that'll do well and nicely. And oh my god, there's a rhino. Uh, uh oh, that's not good. If we get if the rhino starts attacking us, that's going to be real bad news for us. Oh, crud. Oh, crud. Let's just uh, get up on out of here. Boy, I wish I was sly right now. Or I could do. Oh man. This is really bad. This is not good for stealth. Rajan is coming this way, and I got a bunch of guards who know I'm here. This is really not good. And you'll have seen earlier, too, by the way, my total lack of memory with the layout of this level is going to cause way more problems than it should. 
for example, um, you will notice that when we did the bug mission bit, I completely bypassed like 90% of the pathway because I legitimately did not remember what the pathway was. I know I knew that you had to travel a certain direction to get the uh, the bug to and from all the different water pools, but I like literally did not remember what that you know like method was. I had no recollection of what the pathway was supposed to be, and because of that, I just ended up getting through that mission really poorly. I had a bunch of people chasing me, and I was just sprinting through it, heading directly for the waypoint, because I had no memory of where I was supposed to go. And that is kind of happening right now, too. Because I'm shooting off these darts, hoping that Rajan will notice, and he invariably is not. Oh, there he goes. Now he notices something. I need you to head over this way, Rajan. Oh, come on, it's right there. It's a hundred feet. Over there. No, don't turn around. Go over here. I oh, see, now the monkeys are going over there, and they're going to be checking it out. Because they're going to hear the sonic summoning as well. They're going to be like, what's happening? See, now he's getting protection. I just need him to go over to this watermelon. <sighs> Please do not wake up. Please don't wake up. I'm hoping these monkeys are not very intelligent and just walk away. Can I... Okay, come on, come on. Please don't wake up. Please don't wake up. Okay, got it. Now let's get the heck on out of here. Weep. Behind the trailer tractor, Here we go. I can't let him see me. If he does, our plans are for naught, and our operation is ruined. But I also do not remember where the next watermelon is. It looks like it's over here some ways away. Uh, we just gotta get him... Oh, crap, he's gonna run up here now. Do not want him running up here. Very bad news for me if he does. Let's head up onto this tree. That's a good trick. From here, I think we can snipe out directions. <laughs> For him to start running. Alright, come on, let's get you over here. See, if this wasn't attracting other guards, then it would be good, but alas, that's what's happening. As long as I don't hit it, like, into this tree and get him running up into this tree and giving away my spot, then I th sh think I should be good. Alright. Yeah, I think now he's close enough that I can shoot that over there. Yep, because there he goes. Off to eat another melange. Alright, just look to your left, man. Look to your left. It's right over there. Look to your left. Why is the monkey there? Just look to your left. There's the... Why, why are you walking away from? It's right there. Go to the melon there. Chow down, man. It's what you're best at. I think. I really don't know what you're best at, Rajan. Okay, so now how am I going to get over there? I can't rail grind because I'm not sly. Um, I think if I size destabilize this guy, or maybe I can just jump on this mushroom. That works too. Hey, hey, three out of three. Not bad. What? The blueprints! They have been stolen! May oh, of course, maybe I shouldn't have been passing out in the street so often. Bentley, you're really getting the hang of this. Oh, good. Alright. Alright, alright, alright. It's time to do a little uh, update status slideshow. Give it to us, Bentley. Where are we at now? I've got some bad news. Oh, yes? Rajan has gone into hiding somewhere in the temple. I guess the destruction of his satellite array and my invasion of his personal space to get the blueprint spooked him. Whoa, whoa. Hey, who's around me right now? Who's around me? Well, I must say, for such a big tiger, he sure is acting like a tiny little pussycat. 
You like what I you like what I did there? You like what I did with that? If my psychological profile is accurate, Rajan should pick up the other half of the clockwork heart before making his escape. Hmm. Effectively bringing it to us. Well, I still think it's kind of sick how he has two halves of a bird heart, you know, just hanging around, and one of them's on a stick. Pretty barbaric. But anyway, thank you all so much for watching. If you like what you see, be sure to hit the subscribe button and ding the bell to be notified about when new videos come out. Smash that like button and share the video with your friends. On the screen, you'll see more episodes of The Gaming Weekend, because that's the show that I do. And I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.